Hello, Elwood City Limits listeners. It's Will here. And yeah, if you haven't guessed exactly by the name of this upload, uh, certainly my presence here is going to tell you this is going to be uh, not your usual Elwood City Limits upload. So yes, this week, I'm sorry to say that Lucas and I are, well, we're both in very different situations. Lucas's work, very busy this time of year, and I'm actually taking the opportunity to go on vacation. Uh, it's my wife and I's anniversary, and I haven't taken a vacation in, in quite a while, other than, you know, the mandatory, you know, Christmas ones. So, yeah, I'm going to take some days off, and we decided that instead of, you know, me rushing out and trying to find a guest for the new Elwood City Limits, that we'd rather wait, and we're going to postpone it to hopefully next week, where uh, by hook or by crook, we will have a new Elwood City Limits for you. That's next Friday. But instead of doing, you know, trying to rush something out or just not having anything at all, uh, we decided it's time for another Patreon unlock, as I like to call them. So this is a little bit of a taste of what you can expect if you ever join us at patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. We have a special side show uh, over at the Patreon, and it's called For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast. And this has been a show that we've been doing for... About a year and change now, I want to say. Not too, too long. We're up to 40 episodes now. Last week, we released our 40th episode about Ghost Writer. And we've talked about a lot of shows on there. And we're very proud of the episodes that we've put out. We've gotten a chance to talk about shows that we never thought we would even get to talk about when we first started talking about Arthur. And, yeah, we've had some really good times. And Lucas suggested that one of our most recent episodes be the one that we release to you for free. So yeah, this will give you an idea of what the For the Kids show is like. It gets a little bit looser with language. I don't exactly remember if we get too explicit in this one. Uh, you know, that's, we're, we're not trying to do that, but, you know, it's past the paywall. So it might be a little spicier than normal. I'll just put that warning up front there. And we talk about a show called Sid the Science Kid. We had a lot of fun talking about this one, and I, I agree with Lucas. This is a very animated one that uh, I hope will um, I hope will entertain you for this off week of Elwood City Limits. If you would like to join us over on Patreon, we would love that. Of course, you are under no obligation, and Elwood City Limits, the main show, you will always be able to get that for free. But for now. We will uh, be giving you a little bit of a taste of what the paid content is like. We also do, you know, movie reviews over there from time to time. That new, oh God, that new Sonic the Hedgehog movie is out. We're probably gonna, <laughs> probably going to have to do that one at some point, I imagine, um, because we did the first one already. Uh, we do. We also do some special Patreon bonus content. I have a bonus video over there where I talk about the latest Arthur book. The lessons we learned from Arthur. And even more than that, we've got tons of back content. We've got 40 episodes of this For the Kids show, and then we've got more than that. So if you want more Elwood City Limits, you just got to go over to patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. But of course, I I just want to stress again, we're so grateful for all of the patrons that we have, but we're also grateful to you, the listener. And every once in a while, we want to throw you a little bit of this because, well... It, we appreciate you sticking around so much. And whether you are a patron and supporting us financially or whether you're supporting us by sharing the show with a friend or just downloading every week, leaving comments on our social media, nice comments, uh, following us on social media, whatever it is you're doing and engaging with us, we really appreciate it. Please. <laughs> I try to sound as sincere as I can here because I mean it. It's It means, it means a lot. And before we get into it, I do want to give a quick shout out to some of our patrons, especially to one of our newest patrons, Shanna Keegan. Thank you so much. Tyler Bozetsky, Louis Pascal, we have Rory Forever, Young Wee, uh, we have Matt and Sarah, Cyril De La Rosa, we have Awesome Eddie 21, and Casey Cosmos, Greenhouse Vinyls, we have Allison Archambeau, and we have such other luminaries as Lily W., Kristen, Aaron DeFilippo, and Ross Ward, among many, many others. The list is getting very, very long. I had to cut it off at some point where it's like, we do around 10 per episode because I can't read out 95 names. It's... 
Uh, it's it's a lot every week. But uh, again, if you're a patron and you haven't heard your name in a while, please let me know. I uh, this is kind of random. I just pick whichever ones look nice to me at the time. All right, I don't want to keep rambling here. Enjoy this free episode of For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast, where we take a look at Sid the Science Kid. If you'd like to hear more of these types of episodes, patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. Uh, thank you very much as well for your emails, Elwood City Limits at gmail.com. And thank you, everybody, for continuing to follow us on social media, whether it's Twitter or Instagram or whatever. All right. <laughs> That's enough for me. It's like 1140 at night. I'm very tired. Okay, guys, enjoy the episode. We'll see you after vacation and after work subsides for a brand new Elwood City Limits. Until then, enjoy For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast. Hey, is this thing on? (laughs) Hey, Sid, what do you say? What you want to learn today? I want to know why things happen and how and want to know everything now. Why does that stuff change? How does that do what it just did? Hmm, what's up with the sky? You think I could fly? The world is spinning and I want to know why. I got a lot of questions and big ideas. I'm Sid, the science kid. I want to know why things happen and how and want to know everything now. Oh yeah! How does this thing work? Why does that stuff change? Hey, scientists, I know it's been a long time since you've heard us on this side of the Patreon paywall, but we're finally back after after sicknesses and uh, the ending <laughs> of Arthur, like a whole television show ended in the middle of our, uh, our sojourn through PBS Kids, so we had to take a little bit of time and... Uh, a little bit more time after that, but we're finally back here to For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast. Uh, Will Young here with Lucas Mancini. Lucas, it is good to hear you uh, doing much better uh, post uh, strep throat recovery. Yeah, we need to um, enlist Sid the Science Kid to conduct some sort of peer reviewed study of why I keep getting sick this year. Uh, yeah. But until then, happy to be better for now. I mean, or or in this case, maybe the magic school bus to, you know, shrink down the bus and see what exactly is going on in your lungs and your immune system. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Maybe you're like a petri- lack thereof. Yeah, you're like maybe you're like a petri dish, and uh, the universe is creating like the most deadly super duper virus known to man. <sighs> I'm the incubator. Uh, one might say I'm a habitat for these viruses. Oh, there you go. Okay, good one, good one. Yes, as you mentioned, Lucas, uh, we've been putting this off for a while. Not intentionally, of course. We've been meaning to get back to our regular Patreon schedule for a while. You know, I, sh- I should have known better than to write down on my physical calendar like what we would be doing every week because every time I do that, something changes. So, uh, mm. But we're back to it now. This is what we've been meaning to talk about. This was the 50-50 winner of the last For the Kids poll that we did. So as many people wanted to see us talk about uh, It's a Big, Big World, as they did Sid the Science Kid. So this is uh, apparently quite popular, uh, at least among I, our patrons. And I don't know if it was intentional, Will, but, you know... It's a big, big world, and Sid the Science Kid are almost companion pieces. Mm, um, yeah, in, bo- in that they both have this kind of—it's not similar; it's in a different way. Mm-hmm. But they both have this uncanny kind of animation <sighs> that really isn't present in any other uh, comparative shows. Like it's a big, big, big world looks totally unique, uh, as does Sid the Science Kid. And I guess today we're going to figure out for better or for worse. I want to hold—I want to hold my cards a little close. To the chest Mm -hmm. to start Mm -hmm. off right here. So, yes, two very different ways of doing puppetry, which is a big part of the background here as we get into talking about the show, Sid the Science Kid. Um, So, first off, this is a Jim Henson production. Now, when you look at Sid the Science Kid, even if you just look at a couple of seconds, obviously it's computer generated. So you don't necessarily associate CGI uh, characters with the Jim Henson Company, but this was developed all the way back as an idea in 2003 by the Jim Henson Company. First of all, before we get into it, Lucas, before today, had you ever watched Sid the Science Kid? So I, I had seen Sid the Science Kid. Um, it was definitely a show that was on when I was watching a lot of children's TV 
Um, probably mostly because my sister would have been watching it because it didn't start until 2008. And by then I would have been, you know, in grade seven. So I'm getting a little bit older. I'm like 13. Um, so anytime Sid the Science Kid was on, it was probably because my little sister, who's four years younger than me, uh, was watching television. Um, and I remember at the time thinking it looked weird and that I was too old for mm -hmm. it. And those were the two, like, I don't think I've ever sat down and watched a full episode of Sid the Science Kid, but I've seen it removed from any context. Uh, and I definitely thought, yeah, it looks strange and that it was a little bit, it was intended for an age group much younger than me. Uh, so we're, we're well into the era now. Like, there's very distinctive eras when we go through for the kids. There's like the era of like, I was a kid, but you weren't born. Uh, there's like the, there's like the fleeting period where we were both kids appropriate for PBS kids. Then there was like, I was too old and you were young enough. And then we were both too old, but your sister was young enough. So mm -hmm. that definitely falls into the kind of like the latter period of for the kids. So, yeah, the Jim Henson Company developed this idea in 2003 with the Los Angeles PBS affiliate, and it was produced using the Henson Digital Puppetry Studio. And the original title of it was called What's the Big Idea? They had a bit of a similar character style to Sid, but they didn't. it wasn't based around him as a character. So one of the many facts about the Henson Digital Puppetry Studio and the type of show that they made Sid the Science Kid is the second ever CGI animated television show to use motion capture. Lucas, do you have a guess as to what was the first one? I I, uh, I wish I didn't look at the Wikipedia page because I just saw it, <laughs> and it is quite the reveal. And that would be the Donkey Kong Country cartoon. Have you ever watched? This is a quick aside. Have, have I ever? ever it was never on PBS. Have, have I ever, ever watched, watched it? Lucas, come on now. This was, <laughs> this was like Teletoon Primo. This was yeah. Oh, th yeah. This was huge. This was huge when it came out. I watched every single episode of the Donkey Kong Country cartoon. I knew the the theme song off by heart. I used to to dance like the characters in the opening. I would say Banana Slamma. Come on, nice. like I was a Donkey Kong Country, like even more than the even more than the video games. I liked the wow. cartoon. Well, because I didn't have any of the video games growing uh, up, so uh. but the the next best thing was the cartoon that was broadcast on Teletoon. Folks at home, for the uninitiative, uninitiated, if you're if you're listening to us and you're thinking Donkey, they made a cartoon out of Donkey Kong. I've never heard of this. I've never looked this up. Uh, run, don't walk to YouTube and type in Donkey Kong Country Cartoon Hologram Song, um, <laughs> and you are in for a real good treat. Um, that's my advice to you. Um, you watch that, that, you watch that also, show and Donkey Kong will smother you in coconut cream pies. <laughs> also, um, I, I'm not going to mince words here. The animation of the Donkey Kong Country cartoon is woefully dated, and I would go as far <laughs> as to say as bad. So oh, yes. it is not it is not a surprise to me to hear that that was the first CGI motion capture show ever. I mean, CGI from the '90s has uniformly aged quite poorly, but there are some there are some ways in which it looks. Um, dated but in a more classy way like if you watch yes, the first I agree. if you watch the first toy story today it's just like obviously cgi graphics got better than that but it also looks like clearly they were doing their best uh, not so much mm. with the donkey kong country cartoon it it does look rather bad um well, and part of it and you know what yeah i i think the motion capture does play a piece of yeah, that I, you, I was literally about to say that yeah, yeah exactly because even even stuff that has way less money than you know toy story was really a landmark mm -hmm. like film at the time for for animation but even things like uh early reboot and yes. I've been watching a lot lately of Ooh. early Beast Wars. Oh, nice. Which early Beast Wars does look like really crazy today. Um, yeah. It looks unlike anything that you would see on television. But um, there is a charm to it uh, because it, it was such an early CGI show. In fact, I think Reboot was the first CGI show, period. Uh, not with motion capture, but period. Um, but that stuff actually has like kind of a, a, a lo-fi, an, an unintentional kind of lo-fi throwback charm to it now. Yeah, um, and especially, and I, think, I think that's because mm. it doesn't have the motion capture. Well, and especially with something like Beast Wars, a lot of the times, like the characters and like the story writing was 
like would often improve the visuals. Like when I was like when I was a kid in the '90s, it was just, like CGI like like blew my hair back. It's like anything with CGI, mm-hmm. I was obsessed with it. I saw Toy Story twice mm-hmm. in theaters. I loved reboot. I loved Beast Wars. I still do. Um, and but and and of course we didn't know that. Like, this was as good as things could look as far as, like, mm-hmm. as I was a kid. Mm-hmm. You look back on it, and it's like, still, you're right. The the the, the animation does look very primitive, uh, but the 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 story and the characters make up for like oh those the the optimus primal's arms don't like hinge into his body the way that they naturally should or like <laughs> you know or the, or like the landscapes look really weird or or whatever yeah where where are you at where where are you at with beast wars if i might ask we're on we're on season two they've become <sighs> trans metals okay uh, yeah you yeah. got you got and, you got and, 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 and they do a lot with a little when it comes to that quote unquote limited animation. Like once you know, there's a Unicron hologram, and, and mm. spoilers for Beast Wars, some crazy stuff happens. Um, they really kind of uh, push what they're capable of at the time uh, in animation to the limit. Uh, and you're right, the writing is definitely better than let's say, listen, Donkey Kong Country again. Rush to the computer to look up old clips of that Donkey Kong Country cartoon. You're not going to be disappointed. Uh, but the writing is certainly not what that show is remembered. No, oh, goodness, no. Anyway, yeah. So Sid the Science Kid coming off a little bit hot on the heels of the Donkey Kong Country television show. Um, I actually looked up on the uh, Creature Shop website, the um, the Jim Henson Creature Shop website. They still advertise their digital puppetry studio as something that like you as a creator can take advantage of. So. Uh, this is a quote here. System. The system offers an unprecedented level of spontaneity and interactivity for producers, directors, and performers. Animated characters are streamed in real time and are directable like live action actors. Um, digital puppetry technology. I got to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole on this, and it was interesting to learn about. The first, as I, as I could find it, the first instance of it being used was on a character that was created by jim henson uh creature shop called waldo c graphic on the jim henson hour so it was literally like and and the segment that they introduced this character in was literally jim henson himself on camera showing a muppet how digital puppetry works and it's very it's very 80s and it's it's very charming it's just showing how like he literally has like a um like a puppet rigged to a motion capture device and he's like doing a little bit of the Kermit voice to show how it animates. It's very interesting. Um there is also used in segments involving the furniture characters on Elmo's world. So probably when we reviewed that we were seeing some elements of digital puppetry as well. It was first used in a movie in RoboCop 2. So I don't know if you've uh, seen RoboCop 2, but that also an early digital puppetry uh, example. Um, it was also used at Disney parks. In fact, it still kind of is. So you know those attractions in theme parks where like there's a screen and one of the characters is on it and they like talk live to people, you know what I mean? Or like that thing from mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. E3 in the 90s where they had like Mario's head and it's just like... I, I was what? just going to bring up Mario yeah, at just E3. Like, what else yeah. is going on? Hey, I'm at E3. <laughs> You know, <laughs> there's Ubisoft or like whatever the, whatever he said. But yeah, very much. That's another example of digital puppeteering. And it was used in um, <laughs> a couple of projects I'd never heard before, but I wanted to shout it out for anybody who was watching children's movies in like the early 2000s. Movies like Mishi the Water Giant, as well as mm. the movie Five Children and It. You got me. Like I think I saw the poster for Five Children and It, but you got me, man. That's funny. Those are like fake kids' movie names. <laughs> like that's hilarious. Five Children and It. Um, and it's all- even Mishi the Water Giant is is pretty. That's I've never heard of that before. It's a little first draft. Um, it's also being used on a new Disney Plus show called Earth to Ned, which I'd only heard about when uh, doing research for this. So. I don't. It's still still being used, albeit fairly sparsely. And one of its biggest uh, uses to date uh, would be Sid the Science Kid for PBS. The series ran from September 2008 to March 2013, 66 episodes over two seasons. Now, I was able to find a little bit about the philosophy of the show. And I always appreciate it when these kids' shows have philosophies because it seems to... 
you know, sometimes they appear out of the ether and it's just like, well, you know, what did you make this for? Like, it seemed like there's no real, like, care put into its um, development. But really, the what they wanted to achieve with the show was to support science learning. They wanted to support the desire for kids to understand the world around them and to support their school readiness. And it seems like it was received pretty well. It was nominated for six Daytime Emmy Awards. And then in 2013, the series officially ended with the Sid the Science Kid movie. I think this was a direct-to-DVD sort of thing, uh, featuring the voice talents of the hacker himself, Christopher Lloyd. So double dipping <laughs> on the PBS train. I wonder what happens in Sid the Science Kid the movie. Like, because from I don't want to get too much into our episode here, um, but it, the episode seems very much like kind of like segment based. Mm. Um, it's so very... it's interesting to see what kind of overarching adventure you know Sid the Science Kid could have embarked on. It's very it's very um, it's very low stakes. Um, yeah, but, exactly. But if if I look it up here. Um, his friends enter a contest, win a trip to a new science museum. Oh, another museum. Uh, they're allowed inside the museum. Uh, they meet new friends. One of the robots malfunctions. Sounds like a long episode of one of the, ro- the science kid. Yeah, one of the robots malfunctions. The museum goes into total chaos and havoc. They have to save the museum before it opens up. So, yeah, all right. Well, uh, yeah, t- a, a TV movie such as it is. It must have been like a special mm-hmm. premiere on PBS or something. So we are getting very close to talking about the episode, but first, as always, we like to take a look at the cast of Sid the Science Kid. Now, I just want to put a, a blanket thing on here. A lot of the the roles on Sid the Science Kid are you have one person doing the motion capture and you have another person doing the voices. So I'm talking about the voices, and all of these voices are, of course, attached to Jim Henson Productions, The Muppets, Sesame Street, all that kind of stuff. So you might not know their names right away or even really their voices, but I did want to give a couple of shout outs to things that they've been involved with that might be kind of interesting. For example, uh, Drew Massey is the voice of Sid. Drew Massey is the co-creator of a show called The Barbarian and the Troll, which I wasn't familiar with. But he was also a puppeteer for shows like Community, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, The Darjeeling Limited, Yo Gabba Gabba, Crank Yankers, and Weezer's video for Keep Fishing. So a lot, a lot in there, a lot of varied uh, uses of puppetry in those uh, different examples. I didn't even know there were puppets in the Darjeeling Limited. I've never seen that movie. I've, that's like the one, uh, besides Bottle Rocket, that's the one Wes Anderson movie I haven't seen either. I wonder, now I'm curious, i got to see the puppets. Yeah, actually, I think that a Wes Anderson puppet movie would be the way to get me back into those. Uh, we have Alice Dinian as Gabriella and Sid's mom. Alice was on Sesame Street, of course. She played Julie and Sizzle on The Puzzle Place. So if her voice sounds familiar, you may recognize her from there. As well as The Dark Crystal Age of Resistance, which I haven't seen. Uh, confession, I don't like The Dark Crystal very much. Wow, that is a hot take. I very much do like The Dark Crystal, but I also haven't watched the netflix sequel thing. apparently it's great i've heard that it's really good so i would i think that you should probably look into it if you like the dark crystal it's true it's true may well maybe i will maybe th- this is what will will finally push me over the edge hmm. uh victor yared is the voice of both gerald and sid's dad he is currently i believe the the muppeteer for waldorf of statler and waldorf fame he's also been a voice on robot chicken he has puppeteered for greg the bunny which brought a little flood of memories back into my head. And he was Owl on The Book of Pooh. Julianne Buescher plays May as well as Sid's grandma. She is uh, a Muppets veteran and has done voices in Mulan, The Weekenders, and Avatar The Last Airbender. Always appreciate a Weekenders credit that I get to read out. I don't think I don't think she was any of the main characters, but she's like a, you know, the additional voices sort of thing. Yeah, she was the one that I definitely recognized the voice without looking it up. Oh, uh, nice! Been like I've, I, I heard this somewhere before, and it was definitely it would have been uh, either the Weekenders or her performances on Zatch Bell and Naruto. Oh, there you uh, go. Which she, she plays some pretty main characters in at least Naruto. So mm. um, that was a fun one. Donna Kimball plays Susie as well as uh, Sid's little brother, and was the second voice of Rose on the show. Uh, who is uh, Sid's grandmother. Uh, she is on the new Fraggle Rock, and as well as 
the Happy Time Murders. A lot of these actors are in the Happy Time Murders, which is funny to me because I always thought those were like, you know, I always thought that movie was like the people that Jim Henson won't employ anymore. You know, it's like the, <laughs> it's like the control your narrative of puppet movies or something. <laughs> And it's very funny. And finally, as a character we didn't see on this episode, Dr. Rosalinda, we have America Ferreira, who is like an actual actor that people would know. Um, of course, she's the lead of Ugly Betty. She was in Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, How to Train Your Dragon, and she's on that comedy uh, Superstore. So I, I wish she had been in this episode, but apparently she does show up at some point. So the episode we decided to look at is one that is... A, that actually won an award for the show. The, the episode is called Save the Stump. And the episode won at the Genesis Awards, which I hadn't been familiar with. It was, But the awards are presented by the Humane Society of the United States. So clearly it was being recognized for uh, the subject matter of the episode. Mm. Now, the theme song, as we so like to talk about, and if you haven't checked it out yet, we put up the full tier list from our recent Twitch stream of our uh, PBS Kids theme songs on the Patreon. It's not uh, not far down, so check it out. Uh, so the theme song here was composed by two people. Dina Diamond, who has done music work for Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, Splash and Bubbles, as well as a lot of newer kids shows. And Mike Himmelstein, who wrote songs for Shrek, The Sopranos, Blades of oh Glory, gosh. and oh for The Happy Time Murders. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, like, when I say The Sopranos, it was, like, on on the IMDb credit, it was, like, a commercial jingle in one episode or something. So, like, a okay. fake commercial in-show. So, he did, yeah, he did not, uh, you know, create the iconic, woke up this morning. He didn't do that. No, but, man, wouldn't I love it if that was, if they injected a little bit of that <laughs> energy into Sid the Science Kid. Okay, yeah, true. So, Sid the Science Kid's theme song, unfortunately, it's, it's, suffers from Sid is not really singing enough it's a little bit and and obviously it's very hard because the Sid the science kid voice is obviously um a voice that has to be like put on right like it's a it's a grown man attempting as hard as they can to sound like a little kid um and so you know even harder than trying to sound like a little kid when you're a grown man is to sound like a little kid singing when you're a grown man so i don't fault them for it being a little bit too talky of a performance um but sometimes it just kind of sounds non-musical and like sid is just talking over the music uh, and so that's that's kind of my main criticism of the the Sid the Sides Kid theme. What did you think, Will? So this is the this is the portion of the episode where I'm gonna I'm gonna say first of all I want to thank everybody who voted for Sid the Science Kid, and I want to just put this out there. My opinions on this show are a little <laughs> bit towards the negative side. So if you like the show, I'm not hating on you. I am not judging your choices or you as a person. <laughs> so the first note, the only note that I have for this theme song is, oh, no, I don't like this voice. So, OK. And, and, uh, and I, yeah. I similarly was like, oh, this is this is this is the way he sounds. <laughs> it's very like I'm I'm playing it in the background right now, like just to remember <laughs> what it sounds like. And it's like, oh, it completely washed over me, like in terms of the tune. It's very it's very like. Like, da, 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 but he's like, like, da, 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 da. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating it a little bit, but it, you're right. It, not much. A lot of this, a lot of this show is adults trying to sound like children, and it doesn't really sound very good. Like, it's it, they give it a very basic tune. It sounds like. It, you know what? It reminds me a little bit of the Marvin the Tap Dancing Horse theme song, which is also oh. very basic. It's very like they're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. They're just trying to get this across. And it probably is because it's really hard to sing in this character voice. Or at least, yeah, it, it just sounds like it's hard to carry a tune here. So it's very basic. The music, the background music does a lot of the work. And Sid's, Sid's just like, I, you know, it's like... It's like what's that stuff? Da da da. What is this? Da 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 da. And it's like, <laughs> like it's just it's just kind of nothing, honestly. And you get it, Will? He loves science. He sure does. He's a kid, and he's and he's really curious about science. He sure does. He sure does, Lucas. Um, I also had another immediate note after the theme song was done. 
I said I immediately hate this lip flap. So, oh okay. boy. Yeah, wait, so when when we get into it, um, that was my first impression, and it's kind of the same first impression I had when I watched the show when I was way younger, when it was brand new. Yeah, which is that it certainly looks unique because it's like digital puppeteering. Um, like I've never seen anything else that looks quite like Sid the Science Kid. That's but true. I don't necessarily think it's for the better, and I think it looks. It looks weird to the point of being distracting. Like I think it's like an uncanny valley kind of thing where yes. it's 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 kind of like a technological marvel, specifically like the physics on like Sid's hair and the way that the mm-hmm. there's physics on on the hair and clothes and you could tell that um you know because it's puppeteering I'm assuming that those physics are, are being generated by an algorithm and not being hand animated. And that's why there's so much movement on his body. And that's probably also why his lip flap looks so crazy as well, is that there's some sort of like physics engine going on. Um, but unfortunately, I think it actually works to the show's detriment because the show ends up looking less like animation and looking more like a like tech demo. Like I, I, it has more in common yeah. with, um, you know, those videos that... Sony put out promoting the PS2 of like ducks in the bathtub. Oh sure, than it does with like reboot or with with Beast Wars. Um, and it, it, it this is not just in the way that the characters kind of bop around and talk and look. It's also in the way in the the camera is placed in the environment. Like you get the feel that um, the camera is not placed in a very cinematic way. Like it's placed in a way where it's like okay we you know, placed this camera in this digital software in the corner of this room Mm -hmm. in order to kind of uh, put all of our puppets in frame. Um, And you can kind of see the limitations of what they're able to do with the way the camera moves and frames it. So it just kind of makes the whole thing, we're being so critical about this kid show, but this this was all my first impressions, is it kind of makes the whole thing look less artful and and look a lot more like, yeah, tech demo-y. That's a really good way to put that, actually, and that's a problem that I have that I think we'll get into later is the um, the seeming lack of artfulness to it. Of course, Sid and his – like, all the characters in the show, they look like CGI approximation of Muppets. Like, there's the very, like – they almost look patched together. There's that, like, very felty hair. He's got, like, a round nose, Sid does. He's different colors. He looks like a Muppet character. The CGI, it it's, looks like it's trying to approximate the movement of puppets into a digital environment. But like you said, it ends up creating these uncanny humanoid characters that are like, they're not quite humans. They're not quite puppets because nobody, because, you know, you, there's no strings on them. You can't see people moving them. But they're kind of neither. So they're like something new altogether. And it is just not very pleasing to look at this. I had a note here. I said, it makes me appreciate real life puppetry and because Mm -hmm. when you look at a real puppet performance like the muppets although the faces of the puppets don't like realistically move or emote like kermit's eyes like never close like he doesn't really do a lot of expressions it's the body movement and the voice work that can really create the illusion of life it like it makes you believe in those characters even subconsciously when you know consciously that they are not real people But with this, it's not quite so easy when you're dealing with an arena like CGI because you're constantly being reminded, like, especially with these, like, older ones, like we were talking about before, you're constantly reminded that, like, this isn't real. Like, I'm just watching a cartoon. And it's just, it's hard to not think about that even when the goal is to create the illusion of something being real. So, in a way, they've made something that feels less real than the Muppets, which are literally just, like, pieces of felt to, like attached together so and I immediately saw that with the way that like Sid's mouth moves like everybody's mouth moves in a weird way it's this it looks it like I can't approximate it on a podcast but it's just like it moves in these like really unnatural like 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 the mouth is being stretched in weird ways and weirdly exaggerated mm-hmm. ways that all that, that it's almost like Again, like with puppets, it's like their mouths move in unnatural ways. It's just like, yeah, but you have like CGI so you can make it not be that way. You know what I mean? Yeah, everybody kind of talks as if they're um, Mario when you start up Mario 64 and you can Mm. like articulate different parts of his mouth. It's got that like that mocap feel of like, oh, okay, someone had like dots on their face 
and it's and it's the dots on the face that are moving the mouth around and they were probably doing all these big faces to make it look more animated right and you're like hmm maybe this would have been better if they just animated it or like you said if they just made it with puppets and or like like if they committed to one side it's like it's like right in the middle of the scale and it's kind of doing neither one very well and you also see that with the movements too the way the characters move around is in that very again like you will see this if you go to youtube and watch the donkey kong country show everybody moves really slow and it's like floatier than real human movement and it's just it has to be very exaggerated and big because obviously it's a show made for kids and with the technology they're dealing with but it just ends up coming off of like there's this type of unreality and there's a very particular way in which this type of old cgi tries to approximate movement and like it it just doesn't it just doesn't look right like there's no weight there's not as much weight to it as when you or i take a step or like gesture at something so the idea behind this episode is that Sid's dad is building a basketball court in his backyard and needs to remove a tree stump. And before Sid goes to school, he looks at it and he sees that there are bugs uh, living on there. Um, so Sid, as a character, is, well, he's a he's a kid, a science kid. Um, but one of the things that they give him to distinguish himself is that he has he has a couple of accessories like at one point he uses a magnifying glass which i think i've seen in some promotional artwork and in another uh, uh, more situations he has this like karaoke microphone that he carries around that's like his thing and what yeah he it, he he's a little bit like parappa the rapper in a way because like oh. whenever he's going anywhere or really doing anything there's like a stock song that he has for like anytime he's be transported from A to B, he like starts busting out like his Sid the Sides Kid songs. And I was like, this is like Parappa the Rapper taking his driver's test. That's true. It's like they're like going back to school or he's yeah. just like riding in the car. But it's just it's nothing nearly as good as all right. We're here just sitting in the car. I want you to show true. me if you can get far. Step on the gas. He- yeah, it's true. Parappa the Rapper was far more hip hop and, and therefore better. He had more rhythm. I also wrote sometimes you can see Sid's teeth when he talks and it's awful. <laughs> because you never have to worry about a lot of the Muppets having teeth. And then, like, again, with those exaggerated mouth movements, like, you see more teeth than you usually see when somebody's speaking to you. And because Sid's face is so big, you can't help but look at his teeth. And it's just like, Ugh. don't, uh, did not like it. Um, I actually wrote down, usually in these shows that have, like, little musical numbers in them, I write down, like, basically, like, the gist of the lyrics or something. So I thought this was going to be a bigger song, but it was literally for, like, the 15 seconds that Sid was being driven to school by his mom. Uh, I love my mom. My mom is cool, but now it's time for having fun at school. I wrote here, and this goes back to more of the movement, and this, this, this might sound a little bit, like, more insulting than I mean it to be. If the CGI here was, like, a little bit worse, like, if the whole art was, like, worse, like, if it wasn't made by Henson Studios, we'd be getting close to food fight levels. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, like a, a Xavier Renegade Angel kind of, and and that show looks bad, kind of on purpose. On purpose, yeah. Uh, uh, but or, that's, yeah. that's not that's not a bad comparison, actually. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't look like th- that bad because, of course, there's a level of intentionality behind Xavier Renegade Angel. But it's just like you know what? If this were made by another company that were trying to strike out on their own with their own idea, and they didn't have Jim Henson behind it, or at least Henson Productions, then it would probably be getting closer to that. Okay, speaking of the songs, yes. speaking of the songs, yeah, yeah. When, when Sid finally arrives to the school, he sings the song about looking for his friends, and he meets up with all of his friends, and they all kind of do a dance together. Yeah. And I got the sneaking suspicion. I was like, wait a minute. They sing this song every time. Like, this song must be in every single episode that involves yeah, his friends. Yeah, good point. And reading, reading the Wikipedia page... There, a lot of these songs are essentially time fillers. These segments are reoccurring, um, you know, in multiple episodes. So, for instance, mm. this segment, the Looking for My Friends segment, I think is in, like, a bunch of different episodes of Sid the Science Kid. And I don't know this for certain because I only watched this episode. But I'm to assume that it probably looks exactly the same every single time. That probably explains why it's so goddamn long. Like... <laughs> 
All I, the only note I have for this is Sid and his friends do a dance. It takes forever. Okay, I have another note, which is that um, of Sid's friends, Gerald is my favorite uh, because. Oh he is come the, on! It, no. It, no, no, it's because his voice is the most annoying, and that's that made me laugh. Like it reminded me of watching Stick It Around as a kid, and my mom like grimacing whenever <laughs> Dill was on screen because she was like that. That character is so annoying, and Gerald similarly is literally like. He's the type of character similar to Dill who shouts all of his lines. Like, he's always, like, shouting. Um, and also, when everybody's kind of doing their dance during Looking for My Friends, uh, Gerald's shredding. He's, like, shredding air guitar. So I it endeared him to me. Oh, man, you are, t- you are too kind. You are too kind. <laughs> and, and, again, with Dill on Sticking Around, there's it's the intentionality. It's just, like, Dill is supposed mm. to be that annoying, loud kid <laughs> that everybody knows that talks too loudly. And it's just, like... Gerald's just another kid like so the ma- the main thing that happens here with Sid is that they him and his three other friends first of all they have this thing called Sid chat where Sid takes his karaoke microphone and like interviews one of them Gabriella talks about how she was going to take a lily pad from a pond but then she didn't and it's riveting uh the kids <laughs> the kids go with their teacher named Susie on a field trip to a science center and then they'll the you know a lot of this episode is them learning about different habitats. Um, two okay. notes. Two... I have a Sid the Science Kid. Okay, get your two notes because I have a Sid the Science Kid hot take All right. uh, that I came up well, with at this moment when they're going to the, the Science Center. Well, I will, I will say that I immediately had a note about Gerald's voice, which is, can a six-year-old be a smoker? <laughs> it's just... It is one of the it's one of the worst. Just like, hey, what does this do? Hey, I'm gonna do this, and it's oh, that, that hurt me to do. Oh, he sounds it's... like Mega Man from Captain N. <laughs> what a reference! Oh God, just terrible, like awful to listen to. Like I'm glad that you got some like in, like he made you laugh in like an ironic way. Like like I was. I, I was begging this for, to be over, and this was like <laughs> ten minutes into the episode, not even. <laughs> um, so okay, I, I want to get to I want to get to your thing. I'll just say that they're at the museum right now. The whole thing is literally just all the fun of watching kids go to a museum, like watching children in a museum. That's what's going on here. But what's your what's your hot take? I want to hear it. Okay, yeah, let's spin up the take machine, Will, because I give you <laughs> the Sid the Science Kid class analysis. Oh, so. Oh, oh. Sid the Science Kid is in the class with five of his... It's a, it's a the, the class in many senses of the word. Sid the Science Kid is in a class with five of his friends. Well, okay, there's uh, uh, the, there's five of them, including Sid. Five of them, including Sid. Yeah. That's everybody in their class. Or is it, or is it, or is it five? It's, 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 not, it's, not that, it's not that many. It's, it's, it's very small. It, and I, most I, actually think it's, schools, I actually think it's four. Four, in, including in most Sid. public elementary schools, there's about 30 people a class. Yes. Right? Yep. Um, second of all, Sid the Science Kid, we can now know in both this episode and the movie, go to a museum. I'm to understand that they probably go to museums quite often <laughs> um, <laughs> based on these re- reoccurring segments I'm looking at at the uh, uh, the Wikipedia page, which leads me to believe that Sid the Science Kid goes to some weirdo private school with him and three of his other friends. Right. Because what other school is like this, right? Exhibit B. His dad was going to build a basketball court in their backyard. Right. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Let me tell you something, Will. You got to be on the upper level of upper middle class. Mm. to to Upper to, to, I don't know what Sid the Science Kid dad, Sid the Science Kid dad does, but they have a large property. A large backyard, Mm -hmm. and the dad seems to have the disposable... The family seems to have the disposable income on a whim to build a full-sized basketball court in their backyard, like concrete and all. They're going to lay down the concrete. Yeah. Okay? That combined with the fact that Sid gets to go to this fun weirdo school with three of his friends where they go to field trips every day... I think that the Sid the Science Kid lifestyle, the, the lifestyle that's being shown in Sid the Science Kid, despite the fact that it's trying to encourage kids to be curious and ask questions and learn to the greatest extent, it is not realistic for the majority of the viewers. And I think it's actually probably would be alienating to a lot of kids. Because if you look at something mm. like Sesame Street, Sesame Street 
is and and even Arthur, a show me and you know very well. Yes. Those shows succeed in being very universal. They're educational, but at the same time, it's a type of education that is afforded to everyone, right? Mm. No kid's life, unless you are very upper middle class, looks like Sid the Science Kid's life. His house is huge. His backyard is giant. Yeah. You know, he, and his dad's going to build him a basketball court, and he's got a class that only has three of his friends in it. Two, so ki- two kids, I, th- by the way. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think that uh, that's my hot take about Sid the Science Kid mm. is that he's too rich <laughs> and it's not relatable. <laughs> that's a very good point. Like that was something that, you know, when the episode itself is based around like, like my dad is building a basketball court. I was just like, all right, a little rich boy over here, you know? Just, mm. You're right. You're right. Exactly. It, it's, it's, it smacks you right away of just like, how I was, I was, I was, I was like, I was, wa- I, like, I was literally the day of recording this. I was walking through the rich neighborhood, and I was just like, "Geez, must you know, doing the whole like, oh, geez, must be nice." But this is literally like, "Geez, Sid, must be nice." You know, <laughs> that's a really good thing. I just like can't really relate to him. We don't see anybody else's like, um, we don't see anybody else's home life either. But you can, yeah, there's not a lot of. Like presumably, they go on a lot of field trips. I did, I did laugh when reading that whole thing. I'm just like, really, like. One of the things I really didn't like about this experience was that it was literally just watching children go to a museum. And, <laughs> like, so much of what they do is just not imaginative with the with the thing they do. And it's just like, you're telling me in the TV movie for Sid the Science Kid, they go to another museum? That's the best <laughs> you could do? With more time? Well, and, and, and here's the other thing, right? The integral part of Sid's character is that and, and it's actually, like, the mission statement for the whole show mm-hmm. is that he is innately curious. And it's trying to foster that kind of curiosity with children and be like, you know, if you don't know how the mechanics of something works, ask the question. That's, like, the big message of this show. And it's like, yeah, you could be a science kid and get a lot of direct attention from your teacher when there's three people in your class. There's a lot of capacity for you to ask questions. Yeah. And it's like, maybe some kids aren't curious and don't ask questions because they're competing with 28 other people in the class <laughs> who are like, stop asking questions. We got to get on with the material. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's no time to just individually cater to like 30 <laughs> kids. But no, not so not so much over here. There is um there are different segments throughout the episode. We we cut to one where it is real life. It was it's live action footage of kids going to museum. I literally said, "Oh, thank God," because I was sick of looking at these CGI children. Um mm-hmm. the kids eventually eat lunch. They talk about things that rhyme with stump for God's sakes. Um I loved the shot. <laughs> so when they're having lunch in this like cafeteria room, there's a great shot of their teacher. She's watching the kids from like a different like bench in the background and she just has like a coffee in her hands. It was so, you know, unlike the rest of the show, it was so human and relatable. It was just a really <laughs> interesting shot to have in like in this type of uh in in, in this type of show. She's like, I need my job, I got to teach Gerald. Like she might as well like she might as well have been like smoking a cigarette or something. It's just like <laughs> I got that vibe from it. Yeah, maybe it's an Irish coffee, you know what I'm saying? She's got a little bit of uh, Kahlua in there. Could very well be. Um, we're still in the museum. The kids pretend to be different animals in habitats, except for Sid, who pretends to be like a bulldozer. I, I had the note here, you can pretend better than these kids, children at home, I guarantee it. And maybe this is a good time to get into it. Of you, you mentioned earlier about how like the way that the camera is positioned is very much sort of meant to be, I guess, more realistic or true to life. This is a cartoon. This is a CGI cartoon, and I was just like, the best you could think of was to bring kids to a museum. Like kids in real can do that too. <laughs> like well, I can, well, like that's any, is, any I, child. Like I know it. Like like leaving aside the fact that uh, museums charge admission. Any any kid can go to a museum, and it's more interesting than watching a not real kid go to a museum. You know, it makes me feel like they were hamstrung by the technology. Must have been the, 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 with with this show. I feel like, and I'm almost I'm not good at, curious enough to actually watch more episodes of Sid the Science Kid. Just like you, I didn't <laughs> oh, enjoy it at no. all. But I, I feel like Sid the Science Kid, like what they can do with the technology is like you could have a space. 
and you can drop these puppets kind of in the space and run mm-hmm. around. Mm-hmm. But it actually limits the way that they can like interact with the space. Like notice how like every shot of Sid and his friends in this whole show are them standing in a room or like standing in kind of a flat plane outdoors. Like it's always, it's very, it reminds me of like Gary's mod or source filmmaker or something. Okay. Like it, it's all these kind of empty spaces, very cold, very like, there's not a lot of things to like interact with. Um, and it's these wide open empty spaces that they've kind of dropped the puppets in that they can kind of run around in, but they're all just kind of flat boxes. Right. And the way the camera is like placed in these spaces, Mm -hmm. um, is again, very, um, uh, uh, utilitarian, right? It's not placed in a way to make the action you're watching engaging. It's placed in a way where they're like, well, if we put the camera here, we can have all the kids in the shot. And it's the effect that happens is everything feels very flat and everything feels very like non-engaging because you're just kind of watching the models. Like the models are moving in a way that's pretty remarkable because we have this technology. And so the physics is making their hair bounce around and they're bouncing all around in a mm-hmm. way that CGI didn't really, you didn't really see in TV shows in 2008, but it's all for naught because they're just bouncing around an empty room looking at a JPEG. Right, exactly. But I think that I, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm sure that there was some degree like this, this has got to be an expensive technology. So I don't want to hold them accountable for things they didn't do when it's like, maybe they would have liked to do, more creative stuff than this. But but yeah, like you said, perhaps they were hamstrung by the just sheer cost of everything that they were doing all the same though. It doesn't make what they did particularly all that interesting easily. The best part of the show is this animated music video that we get called get into the habit. And when I say animated, it's literally like hand drawn or at least like CGI assisted animation that's and- right. Not Flash. It's 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 not Flash, and it, it's so interesting because you watch something like this, and we're kind of teetering on the Flash era. You know, two thousand eight. It's around the same time we're at in Arthur. We're at the, like the twenty tens, um, and you can kind of see the difference in this like little aside. Um, is is not Flash animated, and you the quality of the animation and like kind of the vibrance of of non Flash a- uh, animation comes through just in this little throwaway segment. Yeah, and it's like it's actually a nice, nice breath of fresh air, and the song's okay too. It's you know get into the habit of da 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 da. There's a, actually a really funny like the at the end of the first chorus. There's this like they have to jumble in so many syllables, so it's like get into the habit of respecting different habitats. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like get it all in there. <laughs> um. So the uh, Sid and May, his friend, who is going to uh, have a play date at his house, are picked up by Sid's grandma. Uh, this is where we get a segment where grandma talks about a real life scientist named Rachel Carson. And this is another use of different type of animation. So one good thing about Sid the Science Kid is that it's not just looking at these friggin' things all episode. It's you're getting like cartoons, you're getting live action uh, live action footage. You're getting this kind of cutout style of animation. The very uh I don't have any other frame of reference for this, like the Angela Anaconda type of animation. You know what I'm saying? Yes, I know what you mean. Um the almost <laughs> like Monty Python, like the yes. the, the kind of like Terry Gilliam animated mm-hmm. segments where you take like like collage art and you animate it. Correct. Um and we, but I was also reminded here, Sid's grandmother's design just made me wish she was a real Muppet, and it's all in her glasses. Like, you know what I'm saying? Her glasses mm-hmm. are so big that I imagined them on a felt Muppet. And I was like, I was like, I bet I would like that design if it were real. Like, as as it, because it's CGI, I'm not very interested in it. I also wanted to, I also wanted to mention here, you're you have a bit more of a fashion eye than I do, but I thought that the character May. Her fashion, the way she dresses, it's kind of in style now. Like, I I feel like I see people dress similarly to that right now. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find a good look at May's outfit. Um, she's got the hoodie and the skirt and the and the glasses. Yeah. I'm trying to get a full body shot of May. I can't... Oh, I, I, th- I think I see what you're talking about. It's funny. I was actually... Uh, fashion and design, I was, I was remarking on a, a different uh, thing this segment. I was looking at Grandma's car. And okay. I was like, what is Grandma driving? She's got like an old, like... 
Uh, it, it almost looks like, like these old, like Italian cars, like these vintage, like seventies, like, like a, a friggin' like Alfa Romero Giulia or something with the big, <laughs> uh, kind of grate on the front. I was like, what's grandma rocket? Cause it's definitely a different car than, uh, Sid drives in on, uh, that morning. Also, by the way, in case you were wondering, Will, yes. Backseat Driving with Grandma is a reoccurring song. So anytime Grandma picks them up, they oh, do sing Backseat Driving with all Grandma. Right, all right. Same with the Playtime Let's Play Pretend song, by the way. That fair, was, that was fair, they were at the museum. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, when Sid gets home, he and May investigate the stump even more. They find, like, worms and spiders and bugs li- making it making it their habitat and after talking about it with his dad they agree to save the stump to just to just leave it so i guess sid won't get his concrete basketball basketball god i i went through arena rink and field help me help me lucas help me court court court. court. oh i'm so sorry (gasps) okay and also listen and i understand this is why this episode won a genesis award because the you know, the moral of the story is, um, and this is a very good moral, you know, there's forces at play around the world that are messing with natural habitats to disastrous, apocalyptic circumstances. And, you know, the world is one big habitat, it's all connected, and you you kind of impact one part of it, and it serves to, you know, damage the whole thing. Mm. That being said, who cares about a stump in your backyard? Who cares? He's like, Oh, the spiders aren't going to have a home. You were going to get a basketball court. Like, what am I listening to here? (laughs) It's like, it's not even like there was squirrel. They were like, oh, maybe there'd be a squirrel. It's like, no, it's a stump. It's like, it's not even there's like a mammal living in this stump. Mm -hmm. It's like insects. Right. Who cares? (laughs) Who cares? You were going to get a basketball court. Like, I was like, I'm sorry. Like, even the story about the frogs earlier, where it's like, don't pick the lily pads because it's going to kill the frogs. It's like, okay, like, frogs have, like, a heartbeat. Like, I don't care about some worms. I'm not going to give up having a full-sized basketball court in my backyard because of some worms. And it's just like, I'm sure, like, a child watching this, Again, they probably wouldn't even understand that Sid would have to be rich to get all of these luxuries afforded to him. They probably wouldn't st- understand all this stuff. But this is our review, Will, and I understand these things. Mm. And I understand that Sid and his dad are making stupid decisions here. Because <laughs> it's a stump. People get rid of stumps in their yard all the time. It's like one of the most common, like, harmless things to get rid of in your yard. Totally. What, it's going to rot out? Like, it's the tree ain't growing back. Like, it's true. And, like, I actually thought something similar, obviously not as passionately as you did, but I was also, like, the kids who would get a basketball court in their backyard, like, it don't matter how much you say to your parents, no, like, the spiders and the bugs won't have a home. They'll just be like, I'm doing it. Like, it's going to cost yeah. me thousands of dollars. We're doing it, and we're getting rid of the stump. <laughs> what we you already s- paid the guy to, like, we're gonna. he's going to lay the, fu- the cement, like. Yeah. We got the contract workers signed on. Like, sorry, Sid. Right, exactly. It's just, I, 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 I didn't really buy it, but the episode was almost over, so I didn't want to kick up a fuss. And I, I'm guessing this is another uh, recurring segment at the end here when Sid is going to bed. He's in his pajamas, and he unveils his super-duper, ooper schmooper big idea, which is that he would give animals a button they can press so that he can turn into Super Sid when he needs to save one of their habitats. And this was in a stick figure style cartoon. This was, uh, this was, um, uh, communicated. This got a big laugh out of me. Um, you know, I was very critical of Sid a moment ago, but this I thought was funny because he's essentially, um, (laughs) endorsing eco-terrorism a la (laughs) like how to blow up a pipeline by Andreas Malm or something like, okay. It's like if this was, if, well, cause if this was real, Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in Wessuit, and they're going to build the pipeline. P- you know, get the animals to press the button. Get Super Sid on the case. He's beating up the RCMP. Like, that's what <laughs> that's where this goes. The logical conclusion. I didn't. You know, there's, okay, we're going to start fracking. Okay, call Super Sid. He's going to blow up the equipment. Like, that's the only way to stop it at, at this point. Oh, Super Sid, he's he's killed the Nestle CEO. Like, <laughs> that's that's what this would... If, if this was real, like, and, and it worked as Sid is proposing, he's basically saying, okay, be an eco-terrorist. 
I didn't think about it that way, but you know what? Like, I kind of see where you're coming from. That's that's very funny. <laughs> I wish they. I don't. I, I, actually, I don't know if they. If I wish they went they further. They gotta do. Th- there's a part where a guy is like dumping toxic sludge into the water, and like Super Sin shows up, and I'm like, that's. Oh, uh, just take that a little bit further, and and Super Sin is like part of the Extinction Rebellion times a hundred, basically. Oh my god. It's a, it's a great way to, to end to end up with this. Uh, a great place to end this, I should say, because that's basically the end of the episode. Um, Sid the Science Kid, Lucas, what did you think about it? Yeah, I'm not a fan. Mm. Much like you, mm. I I thought it was over long. I I thought like you know if we had cut the reoccurring songs, um, and you know maybe spent like a full five to six minutes less in the museum Mm -hmm. you know you could have gotten the entire and also we didn't have a segment where sid just explains everything he just did in the episode to his grandma Mm -hmm. um you you could have had this whole episode in a in a brisk 11 minutes and i think that would have uh deeply improved the runtime especially leaving in the live action and the 2d animated segments as well as the segment with the grandma you know talking about the scientist that adds a lot more variety and my brain's not just going numb watching these digital puppets you know run around this very square flat plane mm-hmm. um so yeah much like you i was i was pretty bored by sid the science kid too annoyed right based on some of the kids behavior yeah. yes. and some of the vocal performances uh it it, it it's at at best boring, at worst a little bit grating. Um, so, what did you think, Will? Very, very good summary of a lot of how I felt. Uh, bo- at, at at best boring, at worst grating. And you know what? Like maybe a little bit more than grating. It was just like I couldn't believe that a show that was made by the Muppet Factory, by the Henson Company, mm. was like nothing's happening. Like nothing is happening, and really. This is down there for all of the shows that we've covered. Like there, a lot of the shows that are on the lower tier that we've talked about, the ones where we end up being like, eh, "I didn't really like this," was like, first of all, chiefly that they're boring. This was so boring. I was just, I couldn't, <laughs> I could not wait for this to be over. And obviously, it's not made for me as a kid. But I also think like this, like beyond the fact that this was in CGI, and obviously as a kid, I mentioned before, I was really attracted to CGI. I just, there's like nothing happens here. It's just so, it's, it almost, it feels a little, I don't, okay, I I was going to say insulting. I don't want to go that far, but it's just like so much of this feels like a show that adults would make that they think kids would like. And it just feels like what they think kids would like is seeing what kids do in everyday life. I don't know. It's a little hard to explain, but a lot of the actions of the kids just ended up being like, let's go do this. Yay. Yay. Hooray. <laughs> Whoa, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Like, And it's just like after watching a lot of like the better PBS shows, I was like, this is this is nothing compared to like. A lot of the other PBS kids shows that like actually try to be engaging in interesting ways. This was just it felt like repeating kids days back to them, you know, and I was like, how how valuable is this? Like I do make no like make no mistake. I think that this the technology is very interesting, even if I don't like the way it looks. I'm sure a lot of hard work went into this, and I really appreciate the philosophy of making kids interested in science and getting them ready for school. All of that is cool. Watching this thing was a chore, and I really, <laughs> really hated it. It's one of the few times that I'm just like, I did not like any of this. I wouldn't want my kids to watch this. I just feel like there's so many other shows like you you compare this to something like the magic school bus like exactly. not only does that make you interested in science and stuff you can learn in school it's also like interesting like they're doing cool things they're going into like people's bodies they're going into like like baked goods and stuff like that they're like exploring things at a very very close up level and this is just like you're exploring things at the same level that you the child watching this can already do like you could just find a stump like when you go to a forest, you can go to a museum yourself. Like 
Yeah, Magic School Bus has rising action. There's stakes, you know. You know, yes. there's drama. There's also like different characters who you know have interactions with one another. Whereas, you know, what you were saying about how everyone's just like it's this this overwhelming positivity. Like everyone's so stoked about school. They're so stoked about science, and they're they're so happy about everything that it's just like nothing matters. Um, and you know, you almost went as far as to say that it was insulting to your intelligence. And I I understand what you were getting at in that the feeling that Sid the Science Kid gave me is very similar to the feeling of when we were watching Teletubbies and there was the segment when it zoomed in on the Teletubbies, you know, TV screen belly and it shows us the little kid and then afterwards it zooms out and it shows us the exact same segment the second time, right? And that was the most I ever felt like my intelligence was being insulted by PBS. They were saying, kids are so dumb, they don't care, they'll just watch the same segment twice, right? And similarly, I feel like this show, you know, they're not saying kids are dumb, but they're saying, oh, you know, it's a cartoon um, and it's got ch child characters. So, you know, kids aren't discerning enough to to care whether it's engaging or not. They're, they're there for just that. And I think you're right that that's not true. You know, even me and my sister, when we were little kids watching the show, I was a little bit older. But my sister, you know, wasn't particularly fond of kids, Sid the Science Kid. So I don't think it's just because we're old. I think that, you know, for me and you, the show is just not hitting the way it should. Well, yeah. And, like, you even compare it to something like the Teletubbies or, like, Booba. And at least with those, I would, I would say especially for Teletubbies, I wouldn't give so much leeway to Booba. But... It's it's like trying to evoke feelings and sensations for very, very young children. Colors and sounds and shapes and all this sort of thing. So it's not exactly trying to make intelligent points or anything like that. So yeah, like I was surprised at just how much I didn't like this. Especially because Sid the Science Kid is one of the ones that like a couple of people recommended we, we check out. So again, I just want to say like, I'm sorry if this disappoints anybody that we really negatively responded to the show but like i would be all for like let us know in the patreon comments or on the discord like if you are really in or if you remember this fondly from your childhood or if you still like look back on it fondly now let us know like what is it that make that bring that makes you feel po so positively about it i'd really i'd really be interested to know because my first impression of it was really not very good so, um, we definitely brought the energy for this one. I'm sorry if it's disappointing that you had to wait so long for, for the kids and it's just like, oh, I hate the show that you guys picked. But I am happy that we got to talk about it. Like, as much as we didn't, I didn't enjoy the viewing process of it, I always enjoy the talking process. So, uh, I'm glad to be back and doing this again. Lucas, it's my turn to pick um, the next episode of For the Kids, which we will get to uh, a lot sooner than this one. So I think that I would like to talk about I'm, I I want to go back to the 90s. You know, we talked about Beast Wars and reboot and all this kind of stuff and I'm just like I'm in a 90s mood. So this is one that I think I may have watched during the time. I think my sister definitely watched it. My sister's older than me. And I want to know what it's all about. I want to talk about Ghost Rider. Oh. I feel like Ghost Rider scared me whenever I saw clips. It might have it. scared remember, me too. So. Like, and I think that might have been like, you, <laughs> especially like in the era of like, "Are you afraid of the dark?" and goosebumps. It's just like, oh, it's a show called Ghost Rider. Boo! Like, ah, I don't want to watch that. I don't like ghosts are scary. But I want to go back and see what it was all about. I'm like, I there's, I don't know very much about uh, Ghost Rider, and I would like to learn more. So that's what I'd like to talk about next time. Uh, and once again, thank you everybody for. Um, for sticking with us. Uh, sorry for the delay on the new For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast. But, Lucas, I'm just very glad uh, to get back into the old rhythms with you. And uh, I'm, I'm always happy when we feel passionate about an episode, whether positively or negatively. Yeah, no, listen, as much as I didn't like watching Sid the Science Kid, it was a fun time talking about it. It sure is. Well, thanks, everybody, for your continued patronage. Really appreciate you. And we will see you next time, if not on Elwood City Limits, then on the next For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast, because that was... Ch -ch -ch